it's always fun to choose the next book to read. I pick from different reading lists, um, syllabuses, books about books, people on Twitter, people on YouTube. And I compile it all into one algorithm and I just come down to just one book to read next. And I power through that book. The problem with doing this though is if you don't have the next book on deck, like the library hold or shipping come in exactly on the next day, then you're kind of left with this space of nothing to read. It's like literally blue ball. At that point, I completely panic and I just pick whatever is at hand and just start reading it randomly to fill up that space. Uh, this book here is one of those books, freaking heavy. It's like 700. Harry Mulich is very well regarded. The other Dutch writer would be Say Snooteboom. It starts out in the Netherlands. There's the aftermath of World War II. Auschwitz is in here. Revolutionary Cuba. The characters go over to Rome, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. It covers science, history, politics, religion, philosophy. It's all in here. This is a novel. I actually have to go to the ebook version because this this was so heavy. In the scope and ambition of this book, you'd think it'd be daunting to read, like diving into to a volcano, but surprisingly, it was very accessible. It has a certain timelessness about the prose, but about 100 pages in, I started feeling a little bit queasy. I think it was the over-intellectualizing that these characters do mixed in with this certain playful, entertaining prose, and I started getting very suspicious of this book, and I just kind of put it away and went off to read something else. But over time, this book kept coming back. I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to have to just sit down and finish it. characters in this book are kind of like the odd couple to each other. There's Max Delius, who is kind of like the Dionysus character, uh, astronomer, very free-going, very promiscuous. And then there's Ono Quist, who is like the Apollo character. He's a linguist slash historian, goes into politics. Very straight-laced guy. They get together and become the best of friends because it turns out that they share the same exact birthday. Mulich alludes to the Epic of Gilgamesh with regards to the strength of their friendship here, and I find that that's apt. I really have to hand it to Mulich as far as how well he did these two characters. Now, the secondary characters, they also have their place. Um, they may not be as fully fleshed out, but I think some of them are interesting. Now, on top of all this, Mulich employs this supernatural overlay, and he has these angels looking down upon these characters and controlling their fate in a way. And I don't know if that's his method of assuaging the disbelief because there's a lot of coincidences. I wouldn't say magical, but almost verging on that. There's a lot of artifice to this structure and you kind of have to buy into it, but I think it gives Mulich this this way in, this ability for heaven to comment on the state of man and how it wants to disassociate itself. And essentially these angels are using these characters as agents in order to accomplish this grand plan of trying to completely sever their ties. There's this line of literature where you have these supernatural religious forces, usually from the dark side, influencing the fates of characters like Faust, Dr. Faustus, the Screwtape Letters, Master and Margarita, Norm Mailer's last book, The Castle in the Forest. And Mulich even inserts some of those works of literature as commentary in this book itself. So Mulich is more than your standard armchair polymath, but he wants you to know that. And he seems to be wanting to pull from all different disciplines and branches and kind of mix that in with his art. We have these poetic images like the light coming off Earth, traveling out into space, containing the history of things that have taken place, such as the Holocaust, that somewhere in the universe, the Holocaust is in space traveling as light and can be seen from other planets that way. I think Mulich intends a lot of the pleasures of this book to come from that intellectual plane, like his theories and observations. But for me, I found the human aspect of this book to be way more interesting. His ability to articulate certain human situations and emotions that are very unique. And the last part of the book, we follow Quentin Quist, who's then a teenager in his quest to find his father. And the book then takes on a sort of proto-Hollywood, Dan Brown type of narrative, sort of Raiders of the Lost Ark. For me, this book was largely successful, and I think it'll gain more in memory. But I think for some, it might be a love it or hate it experience because of all the extra layers. And some people might blame the uh, the translation here. I read an essay by Coetzee, who's a South African writer, but he can also read Dutch because of his ancestry. And I think he said, you know, the translation was serviceable. It wasn't exceptional. I think it was more focused on like certain technical errors that happened as a result. But uh, so, yeah, I think Mulich, um, he had intended on writing something very grand, ambitious, but at the same time, 
almost kind of mainstream and accessible. He seemed very conscious of that. So, you know, take it for what it is. But uh, I'm glad I read this book. I'm glad I powered through it. And I'm interested in reading more works in this region. The Discovery of Heaven by Harry Mulich.